Welcome to Discovering. Tonight, trees. We'll take a look at what's being done in the Escanaba area to protect ash trees from the emerald ash borer. If you got a beautiful one on your property, you're gonna to have to make the decision, are we gonna preserve this one or are we gonna let this one go? Then we're off to Munising for a tree pruning clinic. Stick around, that's all tonight, right here on Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forests thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. We hear the term invasive species all the time, pertaining to fish in our lakes, the plants that grow there and on land, as well as the effects they have on our forests. I met with biologist Joe Kaplan and arborist Joe Aiken for a look at what's being done in Escanaba to help combat the devastating effects of the emerald ash borer. Uh, emerald ash borer in Michigan was first discovered back in 2002 downstate, uh, just west of Detroit. And over the last 20 plus years, it has spread north and around the lake, basically Cedar River. South here, 30 miles seems to be where the, the southern population is meeting the one that uh, came over the bridge and went uh, east to west. And there's really no control. The, in, the insects from Asia, the ashes in Asia have a, a resistance to it, but the North American ashes uh, apparently do not. And as a result, it's just been a catastrophic spread of this invasive insect. And the estimates are untreated trees uh, basically looking at the extirpation of mature ash uh, across the entire continent. Now the emerald ash borer, uh, the adult phase only lasts about two weeks in early summer. So they, they emerge from the tree, spend about two weeks mating uh, and, and feeding on the leaves, and that's not the part that does damage. Then they lay the eggs in the bark of this tree and the larvae end up going into the, the phloem in the cambium of the tree and then feed for one to two years and that's when they do all the galleries around the cambium of the tree which is the living part of the tree and of course the phloem is um is the part that brings nutrients from the, the canopy back down into the roots and what you'll notice on ash is that you'll see smaller and smaller leaves up top you'll start seeing die off in the canopy and the roots are unaffected by the insect so they just try to uh, distribute energy wherever they can get it. So when this tree was healthy before emerald ash borer, um, none of these epicormic branches would have been present. So as the canopy of this tree died back, and you can see the outer branches are dead, and the canopy is very thin, this tree is reallocating all its resources to try to do something, keep something alive. So you can see like right at the very base, all this really vigorous new growth. And that's just to try to basically keep one step ahead of the ash borer. Now on a tree like this, if you wanted to maintain it, you would treat it, wait a couple of years, and then probably cut out the dead portion. Like this tree out here, there's still a lot left. From treatment last year, there's a lot of vigorous growth in the canopy that's left. So we'll see next year how much we'll gain. Like on the left-hand side, it's still pretty thin here. If it could regain that part of the canopy, great. If not, it'll just require some, some trimming back into the live portion of the tree, and then you can carry it forward. You know, eventually it's gonna uh, reestablish its crown and continue growing. So we drill into the xylem, which is the escalator, bringing water and nutrients up into the leaves. And that insecticide, when we put it in the xylem, basically distributes throughout the bowl of the tree, the woody part, and kills the larvae and provides uh, protection for two to three years. So if you have enough trees treated 
in an area, it really slows down the spread of emerald ash borer, and more importantly, it preserves trees. Well, first we have to differentiate a forest tree versus an urban forest tree. A forest tree doesn't uh, have the value other than timber that a, an urban tree in someone's front yard does. There's an assumed aesthetic value, economic value, so the tree in someone's front yard is a lot different. The data shows that you're going to have a peak in the Escanaba area where all the trees that have not been treated are dead, and all the ones that have treated are going to survive. And then a population will come down to a crash to where it'll be a more manageable. So if you don't get past that 5, 10, 15 year period, you'll never have the trees to know what would work or not. So Escanaba had an opportunity to plan out for preservation. Two years ago, uh, contracted out to me to treat their trees because there's a high component, especially in this area of Lake Michigan, uh, a lot of the deciduous trees right along the coast is dominated in green ash. That combined with the fact that white ash was the most important landscape tree um, in the last 30 years, 40 years after Dutch elm disease came through, which we're also dealing with now, um, that was the choice replacement. So many of those trees are mature now and city of Escanaba, again, if they didn't do treatment, would have been looking at uh, cutting them all down basically over the same you know two to five year period and then uh, trying to come up with replacement so uh, when we looked into this it's a lot more cost effective to do treatments which uh, only have to be done every two to three years at the height of infestation and then as the untreated trees die off insect populations usually uh, go down and then uh, you know our hope is looking forward 10 years that uh, we get to have a, a fairly long interval between treatments. This system I'm using the pesticide is called emonectin benzenate. It's derived from a soil bacteria and soil bacteria is, uh, can, bacteria can often be uh, uh, very toxic uh, like botulism. Most uh, that's a clostridium that we can get in the lake kills thousands of water birds but when it harnessed in an application like that, you can do a targeted, a targeted pesticide application to a specific tree. And since it stays in the bowl, it really limits secondary impact, which is really the goal of any preservation program should be. You wanna, you wanna hit the, the target, and not everything around it. So this is a great system. These ports are designed. There's a small rubber septum in there. There we go. You can see the outer bark, and then you can see the inner bark, so it's tan until it hits the white. Ash has a really white wood. And so we put the septum right on the inside of that cambium. So next spring, when it starts to regrow, it'll cover up the port pretty quickly. These ports are designed to stay inside of the side of the tree. And of course, the cambium is the outer layer and the phloem, and that will grow over this. Ultimately, this is not, this, this has no consequence for the health of the tree. Here, a little change, and then you're into xylem, the escalator that takes water and nutrients up to the leaves. So basically, we have a contained air. We, uh, we pressurize to 80 pounds per square inch. Insert the needle into the septum. The first five cc's is free because of the hole, and then the second one gives you a gauge of how fast that vascular system's working. If a highly damaged tree and it's slow, you know, droughty conditions, it can be really slow on the uptake. You know, we were chatting earlier today about some of the other invasive insects and diseases that are coming around, and I know today is uh, emerald ash borer, uh, spruce decline is coming, so spruce trees are having an issue. You've already dealt with Dutch elm disease, disease once. Uh, driving into the park, there's elm trees that are showing signs and symptoms of Dutch elm disease again. We have uh, what bronze birch borers coming back. Uh, another serious pathogen that might be coming really soon, which I believe is only 50 miles away, is oak wilt, which will affect all your red oaks. 
in hemlock woolly adelgid, you look at all these invasive insects and diseases, we only name five or six of them, uh, how catastrophic it could be for this, the city of Escanaba and this whole area of the Upper Peninsula. You know, where is this going to go? You know, where are we? We're at the, I think we're at the tip of the iceberg. We look at how small the world's getting, how easy it is to travel now. And we don't think that these continents were ever evolved, I guess if we can use the word evolution, to a point where, you know, you have a native tree and a native insect and everybody was living in harmony. But when you start crossing continents with just things that we can see, you can see a tree dying, you can see an insect. But what about all the microscopic organisms? We're just talking about trees, you know. The world's smaller. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and there's more and more things being passed back and forth. And believe it or not, it's just not North America that's under attack. It's a world issue. Uh, with my responsibility and with ArborJet, I talk to a lot of entomologists and pathologists internationally. It's actually going the opposite way too. This is a world issue, not just a North America issue. So is there an answer? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what it would be. You know, they're trying to inspect container ships. They're trying to restrict the importation of invasives. But there's more and more that can slip through the cracks that we don't know about. And how do we discover that? I think only time's gonna tell if there's a way that we can. If not, I'm a firm believer of preserve what you can as long as you can until there's a better solution. So that's why I can appreciate Joe's uh, love for the environment as much as it is and uh, taking it upon himself to make the next step. If there's one thing that I hope that comes from Joe is public awareness. You know, we could drive past a tree every day for 10, 15, 20 years and you don't never notice that tree until it's declining. So if you have an opportunity, you know, a lot of gardeners look down. I'm an arborist, I look up. Keep an eye on the trees on your property. If you see something that just doesn't look right, you can contact Michigan State Extension or you can reach out to guys like Joe that may already have an idea of what's going on in your property. So if you got a beautiful one on your property, uh, you're gonna have to make the decision, are we gonna preserve this one or are we gonna let this one go? A lot of science, a lot of data that the treatments are super effective. You can do it relatively inexpensively or cut your losses and replant something else. But like we said, you gotta take a chance on what you're gonna plant because who knows what's gonna get that tree next. Tree planting's important, but I think tree preservation needs to be a little bit more practiced. So save the big mature ones while you plant the small ones, and hopefully we'll have a, a multi-aged forest and urban forest that you can afford to lose a handful of trees versus lose them all at one time. We'll switch gears now from ash trees to fruit trees. I was in Munising for a tree pruning clinic hosted by the Elger Marquette County's Conservation District. Three main things you want to uh, think about getting out of the tree includes dead and dying branches. Right over here we can see a branch that died off. Uh, it it's obviously has dead tissue on it. We need to get that limb out of there. You can also sometimes do what's called a bend test. This twig right here, I can tell it's a little bit dead, but if I bend it, it just snaps right off, so I know it's dead. Live limbs, you can do a little bend test and they won't break. They, they will be flexible, so I know that one's still alive. I typically want to clean out sucker shoots. That is a lot of these branches that are coming off of the main trunk. Sucker shoots really just crowd out the interior of the tree. And with fruit trees, you want maximum light and maximum airflow in there to uh, help against fungal infections and mold and mildew. Lastly, you wanna look for crisscrossing and rubbing branches. When things are crisscrossing and rubbing, they can cause injury to each other. And again, mold, fungus, mildew, other diseases can get in there too. There is an optimal place to do these cuts. You want to cut the branches right at what's called a branch or twig collar. So a couple of things with this branch, it's going right up into the middle of the tree, it's clogging things up, it's rubbing and crisscrossing. So I'm gonna remove this branch right here. I want to cut it very close to the stem, but not right up against the stem. There's a slight swelling right at where the stem uh, attaches to the main trunk here and that's called the branch collar. So I kind of want to cut right in between that branch collar. So you can see I left maybe an eighth of an inch of a stub here. 
the branch collar has a lot of healing tissue in it. So this branch collar will heal over very nicely. If I was to leave this stub too long, then we would get more sprouts coming right out of that stub. It still has a lot of hormones in it. But if I cut it just uh, right, it should heal over perfectly. If I cut it too close to the stem, I've eliminated a lot of that healing tissue and you might have an open scar for several years in there. In future years, what I would also train the tree a little bit is to produce more fruiting stems versus vegetative stems. So vegetative branches are almost always these sucker shoots and you can see they're very much elongated and stretched out as opposed to these fruiting stems, very tight together. The buds are very close together as well. If you run into a stem like this that you wanna keep and you want to promote more fruiting stems, what you can do is just nip the tip off and make a nice little cut right where there's a bud. But what this does is it forces this stem to make more lateral branches and those lateral branches is what's gonna produce a lot of fruit for you in the future. But be careful, you also don't want too many lateral branches and too much fruit because that will weigh the tree down excessively and that can start tearing off limbs, especially when we get an early snow or something like that in the fall. In future years, when you're wondering if there's anything else I should really do, myself, what I do is I try to take off any branch that might be pointing straight up and any branch that might be pointing straight down. I really like lateral growth. It helps to not have any branches that are going to crisscross or rub and then it helps with that pulling of fruit from below. So on this branch, so to speak, I would just do this one is pointing down, that's pointing down, pointing down. I would take this big one off that's pointing up. Here I can see that there's dead tissue right on the end but a live stem. So I would just make a nice angle cut. If there's a big branch that broke uh, off in one year or something like that, and you see a sucker shoot that's gonna fill in some empty spaces and it might turn into a nice fork per se, then go ahead and leave that. And you can start training that branch or that sucker shoot in the future too. But all these are growing right into the center of the tree. So I would basically eliminate one, two, three, four at least and then probably these little ones too. They're just gonna grow right into the middle of the tree and uh, rub and crisscross. So this was a branch I just took off of here, but it does look like a young tree in a way. So if you've planted a young tree and you're looking to train it and uh, just help it be healthy as it's growing up, you want the branches spaced out nicely so that in the future they will have airflow and good sunlight. You want it to almost look like a ladder appearance from side to side on the tree. So this one here is looking pretty nicely, but I can see this stem here may eventually crisscross with something else, so I would probably take that one off. Same with this little stub here too, and this little stub. What you really wanna do is just kinda work from the bottom up. So I would take off a lot of these lower branches throughout the years as it grows up. The main reason for this, when the snow starts getting heavy and melting and it's got that crust on top in the spring, that heavy snow can really start pulling on these branches and it will really just cause damage when it pulls that branch away. If the tree's getting too tall as well, you can definitely nip the tips off some of these uh, taller top branches. I can kind of just nip the tip right at a bud and that will again force the tree to grow more lateral branches. When do we want to prune these things? Definitely do it during the dormant season when there's no leaves on the trees. As the buds really swell up and get a lot more fuzzy, you do not want to prune those trees anymore. Wait until the following fall, October, November is a great time to do it. One very common problem with fruit trees uh, in, the, in the upper peninsula is what's called frost cracking. Frost cracking happens in the late winter when the sun starts getting really warm and that south side of the tree will warm up during the day, but then when the sun goes away and that bark is warm, it freezes off very quickly and it'll eventually create a crack. You're almost always guaranteed that it's a frost crack if it is on the direct south side of the tree. It's really not much to do about that. The good thing about fruit trees is they really are able to heal themselves over very well. So in most cases, just let the tree do its own thing. When I'm making these pruning cuts as well, some folks think they should put some kind of wound dressing on here too. I do not advise to use wound dressing because that can seal in mold and mildew and fungus. Again, the tree heals itself over on its own very nicely in most cases. 
Well, that's it for this week. Be sure to check out 906outdoors.com where you'll find the 906 fishing report, TV6 weather, shopping, and more. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering 906.